Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to uh, this month's Community Energy Lecture Series hosted by uh, ASEP. And of course, we want to thank the Blue Loon for letting us in here and for their fine food and their good beverages as well. My name's uh, Brent Sheets. I'm the research manager for the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. Um, for those of you who are attending the first time, this is uh, uh, a monthly occurrence, usually the third Tuesday of every month. And uh, tonight is the second to the last. So come back uh, next month in May and you'll have the opportunity to hear Anthony Scott, our uh, uh, policy analyst who's uh, on the ASEP staff as well, who uh, can talk a little bit more about, uh, again, natural gas in the interior. So um, tonight it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Bob Shefchek, who's here. Bob is uh, the board chair of the Interior Gas Utility. He's a lifelong Alaskan who's working with uh, six others um, who are volunteering to head up the board of the Interior Gas Utility to bring low-cost natural gas to the Interior residents. He's retired from the University of Alaska Fairbanks in 2013. I guess I've only been there a couple years, so we overlap just very briefly. Bob's experience includes uh, top management and finance positions in the Interior. He was the assistant superintendent for business and finance at the Fairbanks North Star Borough School District for many years. He was the chief of staff at the Fairbanks North Star Borough, and more recently, he was the executive officer at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. He's been chairing the Interior Gas Utility since its founding in 2012, co-leading the efforts of creating and financing the Interior Gas Utility. He'll be uh, up here talking until about 7.30ish or so. Um, and uh, we'll have to clear the room at 7.30 to make room for a movie. But with that, Bob, would you mind coming up? And this is a, a great time. Thanks. I want, let me make sure my little buttons work, yes. So, so thank you for coming tonight. As um, Brent told you, I'm Bob Shevchik, and Across my career, I early in my career, I thought if I drank beer, I would be more interesting. As as I got older, I realized if you drink beer, I will be more interesting. So I would I would encourage you to do that. Um, I, you know, I'm here to talk tonight about the interior gas utility, give you an outline of where we've been, how we were formed, where we're headed, and then really answer questions. If I go till 7:30, it would shock me. Uh, but I'll go along for a while, and then, you know, as you, you have questions, uh, you know, I'll take one as we're going along, because I don't really want you to have to hold them all. If it gets into an exchange, I may ask you to wait till the end. So, so really, the interior gas utility, our mission is low-cost, clean-burning natural gas to the most people in the borough as soon as possible and as many as possible. You know, we are a public utility. And we're focused on bringing energy costs down and improving the quality of life. So it's a combination of economics and um, in the environmental impacts of PM 2.5. And, you know, we, you have, you'll see in a bit who's on our board. They're all longtime Fairbanks, and then really they're all committed to trying to figure out a way to stop the stifling effect of $4 diesel and the choking effect of the wood smoke in the community. So for background, how we were formed, the cities of North Pole and Fairbanks acted to grant their powers to provide a gas utility to the borough. And then the borough formed the gas utility in October, November of 2012. Seven board members were appointed, some by the borough, some by the city of Fairbanks, and some by the city of North Pole, and so we're representative of the community. Uh, mostly we're older and retired because we have the time to do it. Uh, and you'll, you'll see it's, it's also a group of engineers with experience in utilities. Um, last year this time, you may have seen a lot of news about Senate Bill 23, and that was the financing vehicle that came out and provided the funding for uh, gas to the interior, both liquefaction plant on the North Slope, trucking and distribution, uh, the RCA, uh, issued a certificate to the interior gas utility in December of 2013, and and right now we have a project management firm on who is who is doing the the engineering work underneath our our efforts. So the transfer of power, you know, in September the city passed an ordinance, in October the North Pole City passed an ordinance, and then that followed quickly with the borough 
creating us. And it, it, to my knowledge, it's the first time all three municipal governments agreed on anything in at least the last 15 or 20 years. And so this was quite a feat. Uh, Mayor Hopkins is in the back, helped coordinate that, and you know we appreciate you know, what he did to get us going. The Board of Directors, just so you know, I'm the chair, you heard about me. Mike Meeks runs the utility operation on Fort Wainwright. Steve Hagenson is, a, at, is both on the board and is our volunteer general manager right now. He ran Golden Valley for years. Frank Abeg is a longtime uh, engineer for both FMUS and Golden Valley. Bill Butler runs the uh, public works in the city of North Pole. Jim Lighty is a longtime Fairbankson who has experience in construction and uh, the pipe fitters. And so it, it's a good fit for a company putting together a pipeline. And Oren Paul runs the uh, uh, Golden Heart Utilities, uh, city water utilities. And until last month, we met once a week for a year. And now we've switched to twice a month as we've, we've pulled, pulled uh, MWH on to do some of the, some of the legwork. Senate Bill 23 was the legislation that provided the funding underneath this. It provides for the North Pole Slope Plant, provides for trucking, and provides for the distribution system, which is what IGU is doing. And that is, is the Interior Energy Project is the name that ADA, the agency in charge, put to this entire supply chain. In December, we were ordered the certificate of public convenience and necessity, and that's required in order to be a public utility. Golden Valley has one, Fairbanks Natural Gas has one, and it provides you a monopoly to provide a service, a utility service within a defined area, and we'll look at the area that, the, that IGU is, is planning to serve here in just a little bit. So the next steps, we ha had to get somebody on with a background in gas. As you saw, we had a lot of electric, we had water, I have finance, but that, that expertise in gas was a weakness of our board, and so we needed to bring on a team with gas. We had to secure funding, and then, you know, then it was time to get to work, and which is what, where we are right about now. So the team is Steve, David Pruzak, who is the project manager from MWH. Um, MWH is a quality firm with a lot of experience. David specifically ran the gas utility in Duluth, Minnesota. So that was a, you know, a big draw toward having their team. It was, was David's experience. Uh, Bob Woodhouse has been with Doyon Utility in the past as in, and really is running the MWH side. And then Mindy O'Neill. And, and our team may wander in here across the, the evening as we, they're, I left our board meeting, but they'll, they'll wander in and you may meet them. Financing, really the key to pulling this off because it's a huge capital construction project followed by a commercial operation. And how to meet a $15 target at the meter at people's houses. And, and so for those of you that aren't familiar with, with gas pricing, that $15 per thousand cubic feet is a price equivalent of $2 diesel. And so that's the goal that we have been working toward since, uh, inception in 2012 is how can we bring gas off the North Slope, liquefy it and deliver it to the side of people's houses for the equivalent of $2 diesel. And for those of you that are you know, writing the checks for, for fuel oil or splitting wood in order to avoid that, $15 uh, per MCF is also the equivalent of about $250 per quart of wood so that it, it doesn't beat the price of wood, but it certainly beats the convenience of, of, of wood and with the, the air issues. We, we, th we find it very important to keep pushing toward that $15 price. The borough has provided support and bridge loans for us to use the fund balance of the borough as long as we pay it back with interest. ADA has provided low interest loans. They also have grants and bonds available. At some point, private investors and the cash flow from sale of gas are how we expect to do the financing. The borough. IGU is a wholly owned entity of the borough. It's an independent entity with its own ability to contract and you know, incur debt, you know, make decisions and judgments. And for those of you who used to be with the school district, it's very similar to the relationship between the school district and the borough. We would are what's called in accounting a component unit of, of the borough. 
For the last two years, they've provided administrative and grant support, and just last month provided authorization for a $7.5 million line of credit that, uh, again, is the use of the borough fund balance uh, under certain conditions and essentially provides until we have a cash flow, that cash reserve to operate. The whole picture of Senate Bill 23 starts with financing, which is low cost through ADA, $57.5 million of cash, and $150 million of bonds that would be sold that provide money for the liquefaction plant and for distribution to residences in industry and the private sector is brought in as well as a municipal utility in order to make that happen. And this, this is a graphic that started prior to the passage of Senate Bill 23 and it's actually you know what they ended up doing. So ADA financing, it was, was under negotiation since, since then. On April 3rd, we had uh, authorization from uh, ADA for $8.1 million of short-term loans that we will use to get ready for putting pipe in the ground in North Pole in the summer of 2015, and I'll, we'll show you that in a second. So it provided $350 million in grants, bonds, and sets. It has flexi flexible loan terms, so ADA can, with that sets money, say, well, in order to be successful, maybe you need one and a quarter percent interest at 35 years or 2% at 50 years, and they have the ability to work with both the plant up north and the distribution companies to help us meet that $15 target with the flexibility of terms that they can finance. Hey, Bob, could you explain some of your acronyms? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so Senate Bill 23 sets is the Sustainable Energy Transmission, oh, I can't even remember what the S stands for, but it, it's a financing vehicle within ADA that allows them to put together energy programs and, and if, as, as I showed before, the SETS financing was an appropriation into their program that they're allowed to lend out state money at low cost. Uh, IEP is the in, um, Interior Energy Project, and and Ada has really been driving that. Uh, you know, they they've struggled a little in that Ada are bankers, and this is project development, and so we've had to work with them and say, no, no, this isn't a financing project. This is a project to bring $15 gas to the community, and you have to help us with the financing to get there. And sometimes I'm more successful than others, but we tell them that all the time. Eight, oh, I'm sorry, the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority. And so it's an arm of the state that provides finance for things like Red Dog Mine, and they, they look for usually fairly commercially viable um, financing projects that a little bit of, of support from the state will help. We are at the far end of that spectrum uh, in that that if this project was bankable, it would have been done years ago. Yes, sir. And, and you mentioned that the set has uh, lowered its financing within EDA, and, and apparently that's somewhat negotiable at uh, zero to three percent, and you say still under negotiation in, on April 3rd. So is that something that you'll know about eventually or soon, or um, I settle on an interest rate? I expect we'll settle on an interest rate sometime this fall into November. What they're doing first is they're putting together the financing for the plant up north. And that's the hardest piece. And so once the plant up north is done, they'll know how much of that 57 and a half million capital they've spent. They'll know how much of the sets money they've used in order to make the pothole up north. And then what's left, they'll look to distribution. Um, we, we've modeled assuming gas comes to town between 11 and 12 dollars to do the kind of work we're doing they'll have to look at oh, one or two percent and 30 to 50 years for different tranches of the money in order to provide uh, gas to the outlying areas and stay close to 15. so for for the schedule right now this summer we plan to be doing design and right away in the north pole area and planning for gas storage. When gas shows up, you need a place to put it, then you regas it. It takes about three years to build a large tank, and so we'll be looking at temporary storage. 
2015, we plan initial construction and that'll be pipe in the North Pole area and putting the temporary storage in. 16 will be first gas, we'll continue in North Pole. 17 will complete Badger Road and you know to the McPeaks end. Then to the north of Fairbanks, then to the you know around toward the university and then Chena Ridge. And I won't make you li live with the Gantt chart, but so what we have are a series of design right away permit, long lead procurement, pli pipeline construction, and then service lines into homes. And so that happens just every year, years one through six, and concurrent we're building storage and we're looking right now at partnering with Golden Valley for storage in the North Pole area right next to their big, big turbine. Uh, uh, yes, sir, sir. Bob, is there any way to speed up the construction uh, or have you discussed that to have people in Farmer's Loop and other areas get gas a little sooner? We, we, we have. Let me go a little forward and then I'll go back. So this is the map that's on the back of your flyer. And so the phases are colored and phase one is North Pole, two is the front of Badger, three is McPeaks, and then around to the north and west. The original proposal we provided to the legislature that was unsuccessful, it contained about $50 million of grant money just for distribution and then you would put in the entire backbone and then you could build off in any neighborhood that you wanted across time. Absent m money to put in a backbone that generates no revenue, the plan we had to come up with was you build an area and you start building the distribution in the next area so that the next summer you fill in that area and build the, build the you know, lines and, and, and so on, which means China Ridge is year six, which is a long time to wait for help in, in the current economy. So the choices that, that we've talked about are something that goes back to the original request and going back to the legislature. Uh, other ones are Fairbanks Natural Gas will be building up for two years in this area in the middle. It could be maybe we talk to them about year three and starting on the west and working towards us and having some sort of partnership that does that so that while we're building this direction they come in and, and work this way. Um, our CPCN hearing was contentious and if you read the newspapers it wasn't always pleasant and so so, but by, you know, time passes and when a year or two goes by, I, I don't believe that's out of the realm of possibility. Um, the, 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 the lack of money to put in the backbone, in fact, you know, our original plans had the storage up in Fox. And, and that had to do with the practical nature of it's coming down the highway and you would want to stop it in Fox and turn it around, save the miles, save running the trucks through town but then you'd need a distribution system that ran all the way from Fox and that was part of the $50 million that we couldn't figure out a way to get. And so, so we, we are, we're always being as creative as we can, but we see behind, behind just the hurdle of getting the finance and to pull this together, this as the biggest problem of a community plan making the west side of town wait, you know, wait for six years. Yes, sir? When, when are you gonna start construction on the plane? Uh, we expect construction in this first area to happen the summer of 2015, a year in advance of gas coming from the North Slope. We'll, you know, we'll wait until we're sure that they're under construction and they're going to you know, be building up north. But we'll start laying pipe in the ground and Ada can defer principal and interest on their sets money. So we would borrow money that didn't require payment until gas was here. And and then in 2016, we would do this area so that when gas first came, we would have the core North Pole and that portion just adjacent to North Pole on Badger. And, and part of, the, I mean, there was two reasons we went and picked this area first. One is, if you've read the paper, it's whether well, it's the triangle or the trapezoid of death, this area in North Pole has the absolute worst air quality in the entire borough. It also happened to be the furthest away from the competition that seemed to be building between us and FNG. And so as we built toward them, it seemed, it, you know, there were a lot of good reasons to do it. And, and, and so, so if, if the plant up north is pumping gas in 2016, we expect to be serving the homes and businesses in these two areas when gas shows up. This one I'll just show you. The supply chain is the plant up north, 500 miles, and then storage and regas 
and then piping systems within the areas. For just an um, idea of scale, from here until it gets delivered is about 70% of the cost of gas. If we're talking $15 gas, it's going to be $11 or $12 delivered. And so we've got to figure with 3 or $4 per MCF how to pay off the capital and pay the operating costs of the operation. And that's, that's really the you know, part of my job. So we won't spend a lot of time on each of these. If you go to our website, it'll be there at the end and is on your little flyer. This is in Google Earth on our website. And so if you're all familiar with Google Earth, you can download it and you look at the maps, find your home, see where you are and which phase you're in. Um, so that's phase one. The, the core North Pole, you know, as, as you take care of Santa Claus Lane and the businesses there. Uh, Flint Hills, we never had expected to be a customer because of we figured they'd buy it straight off the plant if they were there, so that hasn't affected our plans much. Um, it has affected Golden Valley's interest in how quickly gas can come because as they can't buy naphtha anymore, they're looking for an alternative supply sooner or all our electric costs will go up. <sighs> there isn't right now. That doesn't mean there won't be. Right now, you know, there, the... The governor and the CEOs are sending each other nasty letters and printing them in the news minor and so it's, it's not a good time to go in and say, oh, let's make a deal because everybody doesn't trust, you're not trying to take advantage of them right now. But I would expect Petrostar, if not in Fairbanks, down in Valdez may have a need for LNG to heat their products so they're not using, you know, refined product that they could sell to heat their crude from 40 degrees to six or 800 degrees. So that's the second phase there along Bradway. There's, you know, the McPeaks end, and then it stretches, you know, just out, you know, Chena Hot Springs Road and the outlying areas, Farmer's Loop, and then Chena Ridge. So we're talking the Blue Loon in, you know, 2020, 2021 uh, on, under the plan we have. I know, I, I know. Um, and so, so, so any of you that have ideas, you're, you're welcome to, to bring them to me on how to speed this up. In fact, I was telling Clark that earlier. So, so where we are now, we expect 877 miles of pipe, including the pipe that runs from the street to the side of your house, um, across six years. Total cost for that pipeline are $251 million, And that storage and regas that I didn't tell you specifically in the North Pole area, Golden Valley's plant is there. We expect the storage to be right next to their turbine. Uh, 2.2 million is the largest that Golden Valley's site will hold. And that will provide up to five days storage for Golden Valley and for IGU through the first four years of build out. Short term estimates, Cardinal Entrix did some work for um, ADA and A the AEA is the Alaska Energy Authority that did the analysis of well how many jobs will it create and what you know what are the what's the impact and and in the construction phase they're looking at 350 construction jobs between up north and us and FNG um, and of course there's indirect jobs that they include when they do these analysis the long term estimates are 780 local jobs and you see most of these are indirectly supported. What that means is when the construction is done, all of the people working the utilities will total 60. But the savings that people gain and the spinoff from having the economic activity and $15 fuel or $2 diesel will generate other jobs, whether they be in retail or other places in the community. Uh, um, FEDC had an analysis done of this today that they're, they're still working on, but this is this is what one would hope is that 100 to 200 million dollars a year of checks not being written for diesel and being written for other things that people can buy, whether they be groceries or um, you know commodities or you know rifles. So the short-term economic impact is 29 million dollars, most of which is salaries. Uh, Long-term is you know, income for 
people that are created by jobs, either direct or indirect, and then then the other other spinoff of cash being spent in the community. So, so by and large, there's about $400 million a year spent on heating in the community. And our goal as much as possible is to cut that in half and, and change that so that, you know, our, our kids and grandkids aren't leaving because they can't afford to heat their homes. So, yes, sir. How, bringing $2 diesel in, how's that gonna affect people like sourdough fuel or um, they're not really going to like that, right? Well, they're not. They're not going to like that. There's about. They're not with that, can they? the, well, the, there'll be places we can't reach. There will be a shrinking of jobs in distribution of diesel, unquestionably. And I think the number was. The, help, help me, Clark. You at the. 125 jobs. I saw the presentation just this morning. That's offset by drivers who are running up and down the hall road. And so, so the overall net is still an increased number of jobs. The, the, the companies that are in distribution have about a five-year window to figure out what they're going to do and how they're going to affect it. They, honestly, I thought they'd fight it harder when we were looking at money to bring gas to the community, but I, didn't think, I don't think they really thought it would happen. And so it wasn't worth the fight. And now that it's here, they're going to have to figure out, well, what window do we have? Is it propane for the outlying areas? Is it some change of diesel? Do we start running trucks up north? Because that's the trucking jobs that are available. Um, but it, there, will be a, there will be a shrinking of the number of jobs for distribution. Uh, Petrostar, who provides about 60% of the diesel fuel for that heats our homes, the expectation is, assuming they're still in business after this stuff with Flint Hills, is they would instead make jet fuel and other products that they can sell. And so the impact on Petrostar wouldn't be as significant as the impacts on the Fairbanks fuel and uh, you know Alaska Aero fuel and all our local our local distributors. Yes, sir. What percentage is going to be propane? Um, the the numbers I've heard are mostly in a two to four percent range and it's a byproduct of the liquefaction they have to take the propane out to freeze the natural gas and so then they have this propane they have to do something with and it it will it's it's directly proportionate to the volume of gas that they liquefy and they're looking at six to ten thousand gallons a day which if if an average home takes, you know, propane isn't quite as uh, as dense as, as diesel. If an average home maybe takes, you know, 2,000 gallons of of propane to heat it, when it would take in 15 or 1,600 gallons of diesel, y you could do the equivalent of five homes a day across 365 days if all of it went here. There's some discussion of using it in containers along the Yukon River and along the road system. Honestly, there was a question of that at, at AEA's or Ada's open house last Tuesday, and Ada's answer was, we haven't figured that out yet, who's gonna get it and in what order. But, but right now gas comes from, it's truck, trucked or railed from Canada, and, and to the extent that it's a byproduct, the plant up north should be able to beat the price. So at some point, you'll see cheaper propane either here or in the bush as a result of it. Uh, how and when, you know, I can't tell you yet. We w Go ahead. What about changeover on the heating systems in houses? Is that uh, yeah, we'll, 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 get, we'll get to that in a little, but I'll skip over it when I get to it because the, the range is about 20 three hundred dollars to ten thousand dollars depending on what you've got for a system if you've got a fair one of the fairly new boilers and can change out the burner you're at the lower end if you have to replace the whole thing you're at the upper they've estimated the average at about seven thousand dollars based on the phone surveys they did about well what kind of furnace is in your home and how old is it yes sir does that include running the service line to your house, or is that just a conversion? That's just a conversion. The conversion line is in that $251 million of piping that, that was, was right there. And That's a change, if I understood the presentation to the regulatory commission, the service lines were not included in your estimate. Could you, you change that now and the service lines are included? Correct. Okay. 
and and the the our our model tariff that of course will adjust once you know we have a, a gas flow and a customer base is paralleled after F and G's. And so it's fifty dollars for the first hundred feet, and then you pay if you're further than a hundred feet from the you know the the nearby street, you would pay more to get to get it all the way to your house. But it's the the goal is to encourage hookup, and to the extent you make it expensive to get gas to somebody's house, you you go counter to that. One of the other things we've thought about is we're going through neighborhoods, offer it cheap, and then if you don't hook up or you don't get connected when we're running through your neighborhood and we have to come back, it might cost you more. Really, we haven't worked that portion of the tariff out fully yet. But right now, it's the parallel to FNGs, which is $50 for the first 100 feet. Let's see. Let me go back where it was. Oh, I was just about to conversions. Economic impact, environmental impact. As If any of you have been to the borough, presentations put on by either the borough staff or DEC on the pie chart 50 to 60 percent of our fine particulate problem comes from wood smoke another large percentage comes from uh, diesel and so the expectation is e even if you get only three quarters of the conversions you're gonna you're gonna reduce almost half of the wood smoke and the PM 2.5 reduction will be in that, you know, this pretty broad range, but a 15 to 38 percent range that will significantly impact the borough's ability to reach attainment. If everybody converted and the wood burners converted as well, you'd eliminate about 90 percent of the fine particulates that come from, from what they call mobile sources. Yes, sir. If you have an oil leak during transportation or storage, you've got a problem, whether it's groundwater or what. I mean, if you have a leak with gas, it just gasifies. Yeah, gas, gas in that in that is one is better for that, and relative to compared to propane that sits on the ground and explodes, gas does go away, um, and that's why you'll see blast zone differences for gas facilities compared to propane. On that front, there have been no serious problems with FNGs Hall along the Parks Highway in 16 years. They've had four accidents, and none of them ended up being a serious concern. Yes, sir. So conversions. We, we, won't, we, we won't repeat the stuff I said earlier, but for conversions, you know, we are expecting a 75% conversion rate by the end of phase six, and, and that has to do with a combination of data points from both surveys, focus group, NSTARS experience, in Matt Sue, they have recent experience in Homer, and you look at well, what's the price delta between oil and and gas, and even with conversion costs, you see, you know, conversion rates. Uh, commercial goes almost immediately, and then residential picks up based on that ability to write the ten thousand dollar or seven thousand dollar check. And at some point, we all need new furnaces, and then you'll approach 100% at some point, but that takes a while. It reduces those monthly, monthly heating energy bills and then, then the, the, the fine particulate. And we, we really expect that, particularly North Pole, it's going to make a big difference. So in order to reach the 75%, one, it has to lower your bill, and it has to lower it significantly or people won't convert. People are looking for a return on investment of three to five years, which is hard on fuel savings if you're looking at a seven or ten thousand dollar check. And so we are looking at incentive programs that will insist, assist on paying for those upfront costs, um, and and likely will provide some assistance on, you know, making it a one-stop shop to apply to get a vendor and to get converted all all in the same way. This is the demand curve that you see growing from 2016 on to 2020, 21, when we're, we're built out, and then you, you know, it tapers off. The blue is residential, single family residential. So that's the demographics of the service area that I showed you earlier. It's almost all homes, very little industrial, very little commercial. What is is in North Pole, probably. And so, so we've got to figure out a way to when people average 150 um, MCF a year in their home, find an economic way to get the pipe all the way to their door. And I, you know, I can tell you it's a challenge. 
uh, the, the big commercials or the box stores are easy to reach. It's all the homes up and down the streets, but all the homes up and down the streets are what solves the problems of the community. It's not, you know, for Walmart to have cheaper gas. So conversion, there's your $7,000. And, and, and this three to five years is really based on what people's comfort level of, well, how quickly does it have to pay back? Personally, I think that it can't be, well, right now you're paying $4,000 a year to heat your home. If you go to gas and it costs two, but it, you have to pay 2000 a year to cover the cost of your furnace, it's, you haven't saved a dollar till year four. And so we've got to come up with a way that the combination of your conversion cost and your bill, your monthly costs still go down and you pay off your furnace and it might take a little longer, but there's a way, there's a way through a program to do that. And, and, and so what are we going to do going forward? We're working on financing. We've got the money to get us through to next summer. Yes, sir. Uh, on a, the graphic, uh, the next one back, does that include Golden Valley? And have they given any projections on how that'll affect their costs? Golden Valley is, in addition to this, Fairbanks Natural Gas. So if, you, if you're the owner of the plant up north, this is one piece of the pie, and it's about a quarter of the pie. Um, Golden Valley is looking at needing about 2 billion cubic feet a year on a fairly flat demand, and that's why they're looking at needing storage in the North Pole area to run that turbine. Um, the expectations of savings are, oh, right now they're probably paying Flint Hills between 50 and $70 million a year for their naphtha on that turbine in North Pole. And they could cut that by 30% or 40%. So they might save $20 million a year off all of our electric bills if the gas comes in at 12 to 14 bucks for them. So it'll be, it'll be significant for them and particularly with Flint Hills closing down and you can't buy naphtha on the market and they might have to go to you know, low sulfur diesel, that, that 50 to 70 million might go to 60 to 90 for low sulfur diesel. And so they're, that's why they're highly motivated to look at, at, at more gas as quickly as possible. So, so financing, we have that first piece of financing. The next big hurdle will be, you know, financing phases one, two, and three as a group, I expect. And can we get the terms and lengths that are necessary in order to reach the targets? Permitting and right-of-way work, you'll see people in North Pole this summer doing the right-of-way work and the permit work for, uh, for the, the, the digging in the summer of 2015. Uh, we don't plan to have a you know, IGU engineering and construction staff, it's all contracted so far and really we expect, you know, a small staff of three or four. Um, and so this summer we'll be hiring consultants for the design engineering and storage development. And the bids will go out probably January, February of 2015 in time for the 15 construction season. We are gonna hire a, a CEO and a CFO. You know, we really we've reached the point where, where, where it's, you, you need that management staff over a contractor on a construction project this size. And Steve and I, while, while we have the background to do it, the time and the availability, you need somebody there full time watching a $200 million construction project. And then community outreach. Uh, you know, besides stuff like this, I would expect we'll be door to door in North Pole this summer, you know, be at the Hotel North Pole, talking to them about what it would take for them to convert all the places down Santa Claus Lane, the schools, the homes in that phase one area. You'll see us talking to those people. Yes, sir. That's kind of what the question is related to, that idea that MWH is uh, in negotiations to try and figure out when they're going to get built up there. but I'm reasonably sure that <coughs> uh, the other gas company will be putting in lines this year and, and uh, uh, yet you, know, you have a lot of work to do before you put in lines I guess but you sort of alluded to the idea that you want to see MWH uh, liquefaction plant more uh, uh, of a going concern before you start putting in lines. So would you just expand on this community outreach and, and the things you'll be doing this year when uh, Fairbanks Natural Gas is laying pipe. Yeah, F FNG will be laying pipe in about seven or eight neighborhoods this summer, and then again in 2015 to try and build their area out as gas comes. Uh, we, for for us, 
the the hurdle isn't knowing where our pipe needs to go. It's the fact that we don't have the engineering underneath doing it. You have to start with a hydraulic model to show how big a pipe do you need in which areas to reach all the way through your area. You need design standards to show what kind of pipe are you going to buy, what valves, so that you can then, you know, bring a partner on to do that work. And so, so I would expect we're, we're, we're a full year behind as a result of the need for the engineer nearing to go to bid in the spring. They, their stuff is on the street right now for this summer. Um, the outreach we'll do, we'll have to do mostly in the North Pole area in order to make sure we generate the interest and, and those demand curves you saw are modeled based on samples. It's good business to go out and make sure the Hotel North Pole is going to convert and how much gas are you actually going to take and refine the demands for those areas. And that's what you'll see us out, out most. You know, we're, we're not going to bang the drum a lot. Oh, in five years, gas is coming to your neighborhood because it's underwhelming. Um, and so, so most of it will probably be in North Pole this summer, I would expect. And, and the uh, storage uh, also would wait. You, you not break ground for that, uh, or Golden Valley needs it sooner rather than later, so maybe you break ground for that this year and, and maybe that's ready next year? Um, we'll, it will take, with luck we would be doing a foundation driving in the, in the spring while the ground's still frozen. Um, but, but really this storage for liquefied natural gas is a two or three year construction project to build a two million gallon tank because it has to be insulated and it has to be a certain kind of steel and it has to be welded to standards and it has to be designed to that. Um, so we will be bringing in temporary storage as I spoke before. The containers like you see at FNGs right now, you'll see some of those in North Pole while construction is going on. So we, won't, we, we can't wait for the storage construction just as FNG has a five and a quarter million gallon tank planned for the area down near the dike in South Fairbanks. That won't be ready until 2017 or 18 either. It's just the, the time and the pace it takes to build a project of that nature. And that's, you saw earlier, it was $30 million for a two million gallon tank. Um, and so, so really, for, for, for the speed of construction, both FNG and us are going to be building pipe. Bedding the plant up north will be completed and um, gas will be available from it. Because otherwise, we'd have to wait till 2016 and then start that timeline. And, and Ada is taking some risk by loaning money on the contingent basis that gas will be available. So both our term sheet and F&G's term sheet say if gas isn't available until 2017, our notes don't come due, you don't start paying on them till gas shows up. And that's, that's one of the ways ADA has, has had the state assume the risk of that pre-build out. Because otherwise, you, you wouldn't do it until you were confident that there was gonna be gas. And, and, and for us, that will be, when they sanction the project and start building, not when you know they start filling trucks. So some of the conversion assistance, you know, we thought about how am I doing? We thought about an on, on bill pay program, where as part of your bill, there's a payment that helps pay for the conversion in your home. AHFC years ago had a program that would help people convert their homes. That back then it was electric to oil. Um, tax incentives or something working through the private banks. If, if you think about the magnitude of money is the reason why some state or governmental backing will be taken. If you take, you know, 15,000 homes times $10,000 a piece, you have $150 million of outstanding loans just for conversions. I mean, it's a large number and so, so to do a few the gas utility or F and G could back them, but you're going to need some program that that provides access to capital. And there might be a borough program. There's a couple of federal programs we've been looking at with the with the mayor and a couple of members of the assembly. But but this this conversion assistance for those people that can't write a seven or ten thousand dollar check, if you can't afford to to convert, the savings don't help you. And so so we expect we expect next session 
between now and next legislative session that one of our tasks will be to come up with a, a easily explainable, fair conversion program that might get some traction with the legislature. And they don't have to give you money to do it, but you need access to the capital so you can lend it out and, and get it back across time. So public outreach, you know, yes? Well, what if that doesn't come to pass, or I guess how confident are you that that something will come to pass? Something will come to pass. How big it is and whether it's state or whether it's based on just the utility is the, the range of it is broad. And what it will do is it will affect that demand curve. And uh, the demand curve we saw, oh, oh right there. Instead of being like this, maybe it'll be like that. Both, both, the cost of get, both the cost of gas and the cost of conversion will affect this demand curve. It, it right now is fairly conservative, and, and so we're, we're comfortable that it's not being overly rosy in terms of people's conversions based on others' experience, but in, in fact, in Kenai, there's no, there's no conversion program right now, but they buy gas at 10 bucks. And so, so as the price goes up, that delta you need in order to have people be able to convert, convert shrinks. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, there were discussions on this conversion aspect. If it was really needed this year uh, with the legislature and the borough, because the borough had made that request. And so it, it, it's really not needed this year because there's not an increase of gas. So therefore, it'll be a discussion that will ramp up uh, between now and, and, and this time next year. I, I think we all recognize that the days of the state providing big grants to pay for things are gone, at least for the foreseeable future. The days of the state making financing available for infrastructure projects that instead of, oh, would you give us the money, would you let us, you know, put it together into a financing package, the residents will pay it back, but it comes back across time is, has been a, a better sell in Juno and is more responsible in a, in a tight environment. Yes, sir. But uh, the state does have uh, skin in the game at the MWH plant because if our demand curve uh, uh, is growing more rapidly, then MWH's uh, uh, costs are considerably lower as well. They, they need that quickly rising demand curve and ADA uh, funding uh, and AEA and management and all that tied in with MWH works better to our to uh, sort of enhance our position with the state. Is that it, basically it, correct? Yes, it is. The the greater the demand and the greater that curve ramps up, the less costly each unit of gas off the North Slope will be. And one of Ada's plans for helping continue financing distribution is, as the plant on the North Slope makes payments on its state financing, to use that money to plow back into distribution. And so to the extent that we can, you know, build ahead two years, buy gas, you know, quickly once they're, they're built up, the quicker the money will flow out of the plant on the North Slope and, the, you know, it, it, will, it will indeed feed itself. So, yes, that's it's exactly correct. And, and so our website is, you know, basic. It's interiorgas.com. For those of you who are readers, there's a ton of, you know, everything from RCA filings to the reports that have been put together so you can read the kind of things this is based on. And... Phone number is there, and, and really, at this point, I'll take questions on this and anything I feel comfortable, you know, expounding on without, you know, making it up. Yes, sir. Uh, two things. First, you're absolutely correct. The more beer I drank, the more interesting you got. <laughs> and you said that the deferred interest on this um, and not needing to make payments until gas gets here, you said that goes through 2017 or how much longer than that? What if we don't see this gas for 10 years? Well, if, if we don't see this gas for 10 years, the, you know, they, they will have failed. Um, the... The term sheet that offered our financing is that our 
initial 8.1 million is interest free and payment free until December 31 of 2015. If gas isn't available, that's automatically extended to December 31 of 2016. My expectation would be because it's money they have flexibility over if their plant is not providing gas by then, you know, they would extend again, but the issue is if they're not providing gas by 2017, something has gone horribly wrong with their model and their construction and it may be a failed project. Who's left hanging? Uh, the state will have substantial exposure on the North Slope. The invest, private investor will have ex substantial exposure on the North Slope. And the financing that we've borrowed, if it turns out that gas never comes and we can't pay it back, the state owns our right-of-ways and our permits is the collateral that we offered for the initial startup loan. And so, the, so really for the first, for gas showing up, the state is probably on the hook first and followed by the private, the private equity firm. And, and Ada has actually structured the financing for the North Slope so that when when gas is sold and money comes into that plant, it first pays operating costs. You have to pay for the gas you're buying and you have to pay to liquefy it. It pays the return on investment to the private and then it pays the state aid back third and in that order. And so the, the state, while it was, you know, while $300 million worth of loans wasn't what we requested when we went to Juno, Ada really has worked hard to try and structure a project that they recognized they were authorized by the legislature to assume risk in the project and the way they're financing at least the plant up north is is reflected in that yes sir uh, my question regards uh, the final cost of uh, fuel when it arrives in fairbanks and i know there's a lot of uh, unknowns at this time but assuming that uh, it, it arrives at somewhere between 14 and 17 uh, is this going to be a regulated utility and how often can we figure out what the cost is going to be for the final consumer and the reason i ask is uh, you know you you buy heating oil now and you don't know week to week what your costs are going to be but for at least for the homeowner so in in rough terms the cost of gas out of the ground is going to be three bucks to three and a quarter at a hundred dollar oil. And most of the contracts on the North Slope that you can see have an escalator when the price of oil goes up or down. But it's, you know, maybe four or five percent. So when when the price of oil doubles, the price of gas, you know, doesn't go up the, the same in the same nature. And so, so you'll see the price fairly stable on the North Slope, absent some big anomaly. And so you'll see that, and the contracts are between 15 and 20 years. So, so assuming a, a price of oil between $80 and $150, you're going to be in the, a, a fairly stable range for the price out of the ground. The plant up north is being required by ADA because of their financing and because of the equity they're being putting in to run it on, on a, a model that would a, a regulated utility would, would use, a return on investment, not a, a margin for profit or for risk or for anything like that. And so, so the liquefaction costs are going to be three to four bucks and those will go up with inflationary pressures but not, not spike like a commodity. The trucking will be contracted and I expect we'll, like we will look and I know FNG is looking at, you buy those freezer tankers because you don't want to be tied to one trucker and they don't want to have them sitting in the yard in the summer when you don't need them and, and you know, amortizing those out across the cost of your gas is the better way. But you'll see about five bucks for the trucking. So that's why you're to, you know, three bucks, three bucks and five bucks is 11 and that gets you to town. And so what you should see are, to directly answer your question, inflationary pressures, but not spiking commodity prices like you do with the price of oil. Mike. Yeah, I had a couple of questions and one statement, if I may. Uh, 
have you <coughs> gotten the sense for, that ADA is interested in that $15 set point to the extent that they could reduce the interest until it made that work? I, I would say up until the last, oh, two or three months, they were wearing their banker suits and were saying up to 3% met 3%. And, and as they look at the financial models for the plant up north and the ones we've given them that show if you do that, the first model I ran with the numbers that, that Ada said use these for interest rates and terms came out $19.80 per MCF with all the unknowns we're still talking about. And, and even they looked at that and says, oh, that won't work. And so, so they recognize that there have been commitments made, not just in the community, but by the governor, that, that the target is low-cost gas, and they're using the same, the same mantra that I gave at the beginning of as many as possible, as cheaply as possible, as quickly as possible. Now are the goals of the interior energy plan. And so, so the realities of what things cost and the role financing will play is, has has made them be more flexible. I wouldn't say they're all the way, you know, doing the limbo yet, but they're, you know, they're, they're getting there. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Real quick kind of fantasy. Uh, the university is building a new power plant. Yes, sir. The CO2 is an issue. Have you considered sending the empty trucks back haul with liquid CO2 to enhance recovery from the oil wells? You know, we haven't looked at that. Um, but, but no, uh, you know, there were, uh, Denise Thorson actually did look at a pipeline out of the interior for enhanced oil recovery on the North Slope, and it didn't quite pencil out, but it's, it's not, it's, that's not a bad question. Thank you. It makes CO2 have value. Yes. Rather than the opposite. And I saw a 40% savings. Yes, sir. We could do that now with weatherization. Uh, and a hell of a lot less money than what it would take to put gas here. What if we did both? Well, there, there is a weatherization program right now that people can choose to use, and it's had, had well, you know, strong to moderate success early and has petered out in terms of, you know, the low-hanging fruit and people with interest to do it. Um, that, that is part of whether it's, you know, a community plan for energy or the university's plan is the dollar, the dollar you save in, in making it more efficient still is, is the, the cheapest one. Yeah, that really changes the macro. Uh, if we save 40% before the gas gets here, then that's all that, that, that's, you're, If you can figure out a way to save 40% on everybody's home, Mike, you get to knock yourself out and do it, but yeah. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. So is this seen as a bridge solution to getting a gas line? And would this <coughs> infrastructure be, like the plants and the storage be used for? Uh, actually, th th thank you, because I probably should have covered that. It, 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 it really is designed as a bridge, because uh, right now, if a gas line ran right through the middle of town, it wouldn't benefit but the 1,100 customers who are hooked to FNG. And so the goal is to build the gas distribution system out, tier our costs down from 30 to 15, and then if gas comes in on a major line at 5, you switch to gas at 5. And, and so you're always making decisions that, that take your, your costs lower. And uh, the plant up north wouldn't necessarily be a stranded asset because you could envision you would want to bring the, the liquefaction to town for two reasons. One, that you could then serve the road system off the big pipeline. The other would be if you've convinced everybody in town to hook their homes up to natural gas and you're dependent on a single line running out of Minto Flats, you're still going to want a backup system. And so that storage that's put in and at least one of the liquefaction trains, you would want to be pulling gas off the line, liquefying it and putting it in the tanks at least for the winter months, in case there was an outage on the line that ran from the Minto Flats so that people's houses didn't freeze. Yes, sir. Is the FNG planning on the same $15 too? Or? Um, well, they are just moving into rate regulation in terms of being a regulated utility. So I would expect, based on what I know about their finances, that they will hit that 15 and if not hit it, they'll beat it easier than us.
as you think about, I showed you 870 miles of pipe. They're looking at 140 with a demand uh, about double of ours. And so the ability to take advantage of those economies of scale, I, it would surprise me if they don't beat the $15 mark easier than we do. Yes, sir. Uh, both the uh, token Delta schools are heated off wood chips now. There have been private sector proposals for combined heat power from biomass and toke. Have either community approached you about trucking gas there to not have to go to that extra Hello. Not us, but they, I know they, the MWH team that is working on the North Slope has talked to both of those. Um, and so anywhere there's a road system and there's combustion right now using something that's not either diesel or the problems they're having with their biomass, that, that LNG is, is a fairly decent solution. On the yes, Clark. Trucking, would you touch again, it sounds like that could potentially be an independent operation. Basically, they just coordinate and bid and then haul. There, there's two ways being looked out right now for the trucking. One is to form a consortium very similar to the aerofuel at the airport. Everybody kind of manages the project and, you know, in terms of a, the users provide the board and then you contract out the service and then everybody buys it out at the other end. The other is to buy tankers, have the, the, the people who need gas buy the tankers because they're four or $500,000 a piece, and then bid out the hauling them up and down. And that, right now that's probably the most likely model because what you end up with is, I mean, you have Linden, you have Carlisle, and you have everybody and their brother can bid if they're hauling something that you own rather than ha them having to invest, you know, 10 or $15 million in tankers in order to, to be your server and then you're tied to the one person. And so that, that latter is the one that I expect to see at least initially. Mr. Mayor. Bob, I have a question. One on that follow up uh, on the gas trucking. Why uh, or where is that in terms of being part of this financial package? That ties into my earlier discussion that Ada has asked MWH, the North Slope team, to look everything from the plant through storage, and they would look to do the financing on that as well. The other would be is instead of just borrowing money to put pipe in the ground, we might look to Ada for financing for the tankers. And, and so it rolls into both the $355 million in Senate Bill 23. It also is a quasi-commercial activity that fits in Ada's normal loan portfolio. So you might, you might access Ada money, though albeit more expensively, uh, through, through their commercial program. Which goes to uh, what kind of discussions um, are you able to talk about as in, in terms of the utilities <coughs> having to commit to a take or pay and when? The, there's an expectation that people who buy gas will commit to a take or pay, and a take or pay agreement essentially is what, what the private company wants in order to invest their money. They want to know that you'll say, I'm going to buy gas for a long period of time that will allow you to recover your costs up north. Um, the, the current modeling that they're doing, and I'm not sharing anything that's not public, is they need a demand of about three billion cubic feet per year in order to make the, the plant they have designed initially financially viable. And Golden Valley is two, and they're looking at Fairbanks Natural Gas and us to make up the other one as well as that's why they're talking to the Tokes and the, you know, Glen Allen may not even be in need, but they're talking to them. And so, so they're trying to accumulate three billion cubic feet of demand that people will sign up to. Timeline is expected mid-July is when they're gonna want that. Uh, for, for us, without any pipe in the ground, it's hard to commit long-term to buy gas when your, your, your commitment is contingent on Ada's willingness to finance you out across the years. So I expect for, for us, and I think probably for F&G as well, you'll see a combination a promise to take or pay, and a promise that I'll buy all my gas from you. Because they can look at the same demand curves and they can look at the same build outs and they know ADA needs to be successful. And so some combination of what's called an all requirements commitment and a take or pay is what I would expect. So how does that, how does that compare to 
there's lots of discussion this year in the legislature about a small gas line and a big gas line. So if the big gas line doesn't move forward, you have a small gas line and we're making a commitment to uh, plant up north, but yet the gas line keeps going forward. This is your last one because there's other questions, but I will answer it. Um, the, the, the large gas line, there are out clauses both in the plant up north and in the loan conditions that if there is a major gas sale and an alternative supply that you can jump to that and that Ada will take the risk and they'll resell the assets up north. If there's a small diameter line and say it comes in at $9.75, which is the one I think that, that the, the ASAP line came out with a while back, and you've committed long term to buy gas for 11 and a half, we would still have to buy gas for 11 and a half and essentially you've missed uh, a hedging, you've, you've hedged your costs for a number of years, but you've also foregone the bypass opportunity. But if you don't at least commit to that, you'll never have the gas from the first plant. And so it's, so you, you don't want to, you don't want to overcommit and you don't want to commit at too high a price, but you have to, you have to be willing to forego some newer technology that brings you something absent a major gas sale in order to get the plant up north built. And, you know, Golden Valley will have to do the same in order for it to work. Yes, sir. You had one right next to the mayor? Yes. Yeah, uh, FNG in the past to hook up the gas, they maybe sometimes pull out your fuel tank. Are you guys going to require that to, or to demand that? So that <laughs> I hadn't even thought of that as a possibility, no. Um, you know, I know they had some trouble with people saying, yes, hook up to my house, and then, then not buying. And so they were on the hook for running the supply line for 50 bucks and not buying any gas. And, and you know, if it gets to be a problem, th there's probably there are probably multiple ways to solve that problem, and I'm not sure that's the one we would pick. Yes, ma'am. Um, I saw that the military bases aren't included. Are they just, they do their own thing? Is that why they're not on there? They're, they're not on there right now because they have coal-fired plants that have been refurbished fairly recently. And so, so in the long term for the communities, say if there was $5 gas, you could expect, you know, it would reach... The, you know, when it's competitive with coal, then they'll look at it on Fort Wainwright. It's a, still a possibility at the university and downtown, but the, but the issues of gas coming in at $15 or higher and coal costs, you know, five, it's, it's hard to get somebody to do a huge conversion when the, the cost differential is so great. And so, so they're on our maps, they're in the long-term plan, and they're in the, the big pipeline plan, but not, not, I would say, in the next five years. Mike. Have you contemplated a service area concept as a backup plan? Is that in any discussion? Um, uh, so for those of you who don't know, the service area concept is kind of like our road service areas. They call them LIDs, local infrastructure districts, and a neighborhood can say, we'll put a mill on our homes, and that will pay for the pipe to run up and down our streets. Um, we, we think that might be part of the solution down the road. Right now, to get somebody to vote and say, yes, indeed, I'll you know, tax myself additionally because somebody has promised they'll run gas in my neighborhood when people have been able to read stories since 1957 that gas is coming to their neighborhood. The likelihood that people will believe you until gas starts showing up in neighborhoods is small. And, and so, so it is a tool. It was used in Matsu, I believe, but it's not, it's not going to be the one that gets us started. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> this question is outside of IGU's function, but uh, have you heard anything about a possibility of a uh, uh, Tower Hill maybe developing a powerhouse of live good for a mine and or an organization like Tana Chiefs putting in an embarkation port at the Yukon River for distribution of gas. I, I talked to the Tana, I'll start with the second one first. I talked to the Tanana Chiefs people quite a bit when Senate Bill 23 was going through and and they are trying to figure out ways to containerize and use the Yukon River, whether it be a tap off a line or whether it be a truck being able to release gas or put, you know, 
propane was the easier one. And so, so there are ongoing discussions with those. The high cost of storage in the villages are the, are, is the tough nut they're trying to crack. Uh, Tower Hills, I know those guys fairly well, went to school with most of them. And they are looking at both generation at the site and asking Golden Valley to put in generation that they pay for and running lines. And it's a combination of economics and permitting, I think, that will make the call as to which way they go. So they, they're looking at both. And we are 712, so I'd go one more or we're done. Could you speak to the flexibility of the plant that's being built on the slope? There was a question earlier about uh, um, how fixed that is or how maybe inflexible it is but if a big or a different size pipeline comes from them uh, what are the options there for that plant to be uh, I think you mentioned earlier maybe part of it could be dismantled brought to town and used as backup production the, the technology for liquefying natural gas is I'm not an engineer but to my understanding is is fairly off the shelf and they come in they call them trains that generate capacity of three billion cubic feet per train. And so, so they're, they're capable of bringing one train to town, selling one train to Tower Hills, and shipping one train to California to repurpose. You know, you'd have some lost capital in you know, putting them together, but, but they, they have value. They're also modular the other way. So the real decision point is say this is all wildly successful between us F and G and Golden Valley, we could run out of capacity on the North Slope sometime between 2018 and 2020. And so then the question is, do you add additional trains at 3B a piece and you can build that plant that they're talking to up to about 20, which would cover the whole community? Or then do you look down to Cook Inlet where you have supplies coming from both directions for redundancy? And that's, that's probably you know, head scratching that's going to happen sometime between 2016 and 17 is do you, do you expand up north? Is the big line coming? Do you find an alternative source? But, but really the, that modular approach to both what they're building and its ability to either expand or be taken apart makes them, while not, while not free to move, it, you don't lose, it's not an entire uh, stranded asset if, if things change. And with that, I think I'll thank you all for your interest and your questions.